All right, let's wrap up privacy and move into the news gathering torts. We're now dealing with intrusion. Intrusion is pretty easy to understand. Each one of us has places where we go that we really don't expect and wouldn't appreciate having a bunch of strangers troop through. Uh, and that's the essence of intrusion. We have a right to be left alone when we're in our private moments in our private places. So if somebody intrudes into a place where the plaintiff has a reasonable expectation of privacy and where the intrusion would be highly offensive to a reasonable person, that's the essence of the tort. So, reasonable expectation of privacy, offensiveness. Entry can be either physical or electronic. And the interesting thing about intrusion is that you don't need publication. The mere fact of intrusion before publication is enough to satisfy the requirements. Let's start with our first cases, Dieterman versus Time. Uh, sorry for the typo, it's not Dieterman, it's Dieterman versus Time. Uh, this is our first key case in intrusion. Mr. Dieterman, a veteran of World War II, came back, uh, bought some Army surplus equipment, and set himself up as a medical person, a doctor, offering diagnoses to people who would come to his house. Uh, this was in the state of California. The California authorities were going to crack down on him and other people practicing medicine without a license. Look Magazine contacted the California officials and they said, why don't you help us out with this? And so Look, which of course is owned by Time, uh, sent a reporter and a photographer to California. They went up to Mr. Dieterman's house, knocked on the door, he let them in, and they came in. The reporter, the woman, had a microphone and radio transmitter in her purse and the conversation that took place in the house was transmitted to the California authorities who were recording the conversation in vehicles on the street. The photographer had a concealed camera that would allow him to take pictures without making any sound. So they came to see Mr. Dedeman and said, I have a problem, I have a lump in my breast. Uh, then Mr. Dedeman took a wand, well, that's what they described it as, ran it over the reporter's body. He had some uh, computer equipment, so it made appropriate noises and blinked appropriate lights. And then he told the woman that her lump in her breast was a result of having eaten rancid butter some years earlier. The reporter and photographer thanked Mr. Dieterman for his diagnosis. They left. Shortly thereafter, the California authorities came in, arrested him, charged him with practicing medicine without a license. He was convicted. But he knew what happened because, of course, Look Magazine published his story, and he sued Time, the parent company for Look, uh, on a claim of intrusion. Judge Sir Shirley Hufstetler uh, ruled in the case, saying that it is true that when people come to our doors, they are not always who they say they are. But, she wrote, we should not have to risk the possibility of our conversations broadcast in stereophonic sound to the world, nor what happens inside our dwellings to be depicted in technicolor and cinemascope for all people to see. And so Mr. Dieterman won his intrusion case. The Dieterman case is still good law, and keep that in mind. Uh, he got a fairly small recovery uh, because, of course, uh, he had been engaged in illegal conduct when the intrusion took place. John Doe's 1 through 30 versus Franco Productions. It's not James Franco, different Franco entirely. Uh, what happened was that uh, someone snuck uh, camera phones into the locker room and the shower room uh, at a major university and got video of members of the wrestling team changing and showering uh, and the video was then incorporated into ads for a website offering to provide gay porn to subscribers. The plaintiffs are listed as John Doe because they of course didn't want their real names to be included in the filings. 
Franco Productions never showed up, and John Doe's 1 through 30 won a default judgment, that is to say the other side forfeited, uh, and that judgment is still outstanding. But they had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the locker room and the showers that they would not be recorded. Barber versus Time, we see Miss Barber again. Uh, here we have a claim for intrusion, separate from the private facts. Remember, of course, that a freelance photographer uh, learned about Mrs. Barber's condition, went to the hospital where she was being treated, went into her room, and took pictures of her. Uh, she sued Time, which had purchased the photographer's work uh, through Life magazine. And the courts found that she had a reasonable expectation of privacy in her hospital room. Uh, they likened it to a bedroom in a private home. Uh, on that ground, uh, the photographer's entry constituted intrusion. Then we have Le Mistral versus CBS. Le Mistral, kind of a Tony restaurant in the Washington, D.C. area. CBS, the owner of the network, uh, operated and owned station. And the station was following up on reports from the health department that some of the more expensive restaurants in the district were getting terrible grades on health inspections. So uh, the local CBS station decided to send a reporter and camera team to Le Mistral, which was popular, uh, and they uh, went to the restaurant turned on the camera, turned on the lights, opened up the door, walked in, past the maitre d' station, into the dining room, and then into the kitchen where they hoped to be able to find uh, footage of rodent droppings, uh, dead roaches, whatever else that you might expect to find in a kitchen that's not particularly clean. Le Mistral sued CBS for intrusion. Some of you are thinking, well, it's a business. It's open to the public. How can there be intrusion? For the initial camera shots, when they are outside the restaurant on the sidewalk, there is no intrusion. When they go into the restaurant to where the maitre d' station is and the cloak room and the hat check person, there is no intrusion. It's still visible from the public. The dining room is open to the public but it's a special sort of public. They open the dining room to their business invitees. That is to say, people who are going to do business with them by buying and consuming the food. The kitchen, however, is off limits. Only employees of the restaurant were permitted back there. And CBS's intrusion with its camera into the kitchen constituted a tort, and the restaurant won its case. Again, Keep in mind, there's a reasonable expectation of privacy, and somebody steps into it. On the other hand, we have Jobert versus Crowley Post Dispatch. Uh, the Jobert, Mr. and Mrs. Jobert, was out, were out on vacation. While they were out on vacation, a photographer for the Crowley, Louisiana Post Dispatch took a photo of their home as he was going down the street. The photo ran in the newspaper as wild art. Wild art is defined as art that is not coupled with a story. And the caption read, One of Crowley's stately homes, a bit weather-worn and unkempt, stands in the shadow of a magnolia tree. The Jobert's came back from vacation. People said your house was in the paper. They looked at the photo, the caption, and they sued the newspaper, claiming intrusion. That claim lost because the courts held that a person or photographer in a public place, that is to say a public sidewalk and a public street, whatever that person can see uh, with normal human vision is fair game. It's in public and there can be no reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, Cape Publications versus Bridges. Uh, again, we have a newspaper case. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bridges were married, they divorced. Uh, Mr. Bridges didn't take it well, so one day he kidnaps Mrs. Bridges, uh, forces her at gunpoint to go to his apartment. Once they're at his apartment, he forces her to strip. He takes her clothes away, uh, thinking that she will not dare run outside naked. Uh, the cops find out about it. 
they encircle the apartment building, they're in negotiations. Uh, when they hear a gunshot, fearing that Mr. Bridges is shooting Mrs. Bridges, they burst into the apartment. A police officer grabs Mrs. Bridges by the wrist and then pulls her out of the apartment, pulls her across the street to a waiting patrol car. Uh, she's put into the back uh, and the door closed and she has a bit of privacy. Her only clothing during that ordeal was a dish towel that she grabbed from the kitchen as the officer was dragging her out of the apartment. She tried her best to cover up using the dish towel, but it didn't do 100% of the job. Uh, Kate Publications published photos of her being pulled across the street. She sued, alleging intrusion. And once again, the court said, the photographer was standing on a public street, on a public sidewalk. He had every right to be there. Anything he could see is in the public, and there can be no reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, so, if you like to sunbathe, and you sunbathe behind a fence, if it's a tall, solid wooden fence, you'll have a reasonable expectation of privacy. But if it's a cyclone fence, then you have no expectation of privacy. So keep those things in mind. Intrusion is linked to trespass, which is both a crime and a tort. Trespass the tort is distinct from intrusion. Uh, with trespass, there doesn't need to be a reasonable expectation of privacy. For both the crime and the tort of trespass, the element is the non-consensual entry onto the property of another or a refusal to leave the property of another after the person in charge of the property asks or tells you to leave. Trespass is a strict liability crime and tort. It does not require mens re, and you cannot defend on the grounds that you didn't know you were trespassing. Uh, and every year at uh, in hunting season, deer hunting season, uh, in those states where they hunt deer, uh, you have cases every fall where hunters in pursuit of deer have tramped through the forest and stepped onto the property of a private landowner. Them stepping onto the property constitutes trespass. And the landowner can call the sheriff's department, have someone come out and arrest the people, or the landowner can show up with a shotgun, get identification, and then sue those people for trespass. Uh, you can do both of those things. So even if you think you're not trespassing, even though you're not aware that the property belongs to someone else and they haven't given consent for you to be there, uh, you are still going to be convicted or you're going to be found liable of committing the tort. And some of you are scratching your heads thinking, well, you know, at, at my hometown, my folks own their house, they own the lawn, they have their sidewalk. How is it that uh, the postman gets to walk up or delivery people get to walk up or the meter readers get to go to the side of the house. Uh, how can they do that without being arrested or sued? There is a term in the law called curtilage, uh, C-U-R-T-I-L-A-G-E. Curtilage is the area surrounding a residence and by long-standing custom and usage, it has been freely available for people uh, to pass over. So you might, when you were younger, have taken a shortcut through a neighbor's yard. That's using the curtilage. Uh, the curtilage can be affected by the erection of a fence and the posting of a no trespassing sign. Otherwise, people just say, you want to get your mail, you have to let people walk on the grass and on the sidewalk. Defenses to trespass, uh, consent is the defense to trespass. Consent may be express or consent may be implied. An express consent would be, come on over to my apartment at five, we'll have dinner. The words are spoken, there is the invitation. Implied consent can arise out of a business relationship. Those of you who still go to McDonald's, 
You don't stand at the edge of the parking lot and yell at McDonald's, hey, Ronald, can I come in and buy a Big Mac? No, there is an implied consent. The business is inviting you in to be able to buy the food. Uh, if you go home, you don't own the house where your parents live, but you don't have to stand outside, ring the doorbell, and ask them for permission to come inside. There is an implied consent uh, based upon the familial relationship. If you share an apartment or a house with roommates, you don't have to ask them for permission because there is an implied consent based upon that relationship. Consent may be conditioned. So going back to McDonald's, if you go to McDonald's and you're not wearing a shirt or shoes, then the terms of consent no longer exist and McDonald's can say stay out of the restaurant or leave the restaurant because you do not have consent. So we can have consent withdrawn or conditioned. Uh, it used to be in the bad old days that uh, district attorneys in Texas would, as they were getting ready to run for re-election, uh, call the cops in, announce he was going to go bust the local adult bookstore, and then with the TV cameras in tow and reporters following, the DA and the police department would go to the adult bookstore, they would walk in, uh, the DA would uh, serve a search warrant, they'd look for obscene materials, the TV cameras got to do a quick pan and get a tantalizing glimpse of flesh-colored covers of uh, videos or books. Uh, the reporters got to write down the names of these uh, titles, which would be titillating to the audience. And the DA would have gotten some really good pre-election publicity. But some smart guy uh, who learned about trespass and consent uh, started to tell the owners of the adult bookstores that they should simply post a notice saying that no cameras, tape recorders, or other electronic re recording devices would be permitted on the premises. That would condition the consent. So if the TV guys went in with their TV camera, they would be trespassing. So the TV guys didn't go in with a camera. Uh, the newspaper guys didn't go in with the camera. Nobody went in with a tape recorder. Because there was no more local coverage of the bust of the adult bookstore, uh, DA stopped doing it because it didn't really get them any favorable publicity. <coughs> Today, in the wake of Food Lion, when you go to a grocery store or pretty much any other business, you may see a sign that says, no cameras, tape recorders permitted. Uh, that's because of the undercover primetime investigation of the Food Lion grocery chain. So keep that in mind. Uh, those of you have, who have been doing reporting and have gone into a local department store uh, to do a story on whatever, uh, when the people see you, they say, you can't take video here, you can't record here, uh, they're within their rights to do so because it is private property. Key cases and in intrusion, Ayeni versus CBS. Uh, Mr. Ayeni was suspected of being involved in credit card counterfeiting. Uh, we didn't all just do it on the internet before. Uh, and so Secret Service agents who deal with counterfeiting went to his home one night hoping to find him and more importantly hoping to find hundreds of credit card blanks. The just rectangular pieces of plastic that get imprinted and the little magnetic stripe um, magnetized. He was in a home. Mrs. Ayeni was there along with their toddler child. The Secret Service had invited CBS to go along on the raid and so they were there in the apartment when the Secret Service was searching for things and asking Mrs. Ayeni where her husband was. Uh, Mrs. Ayeni protested the presence of the cameras at one point, she took a handkerchief in both hands and held it up in front of her child's face to shield him from the camera, and a Secret Service agent snatched the handkerchief from her hands, uh, allowing CBS to get video of the kid. The Ayeni family, minus the husband, of course, filed suit for intrusion, and the district court was very critical of CBS. 
comparing CBS to a burglar and saying that CBS's taking of images from the home was no different from a burglar stealing property from a family. Wilson versus Lane. Uh, this involves the U.S. Marshals. They were engaged in a project to try to find and arrest uh, persons who were wanted on outstanding warrants. They invited the Washington Post to send people along, so a Washington Post reporter and a Washington Post photographer accompanied uh, the U.S. Marshals. They went to the Wilson home. Uh, Mr. Wilson was being sought on federal charges. They went to his parents' house. So very early in the morning, uh, armed with a search warrant, the U.S. Marshals break in the door, rush into the house. Uh, Mr. Wilson comes out of the bedroom. He's in his shorts, and they grab him, wrestle him to the ground, and handcuff him. Mrs. Wilson comes out of the bedroom in her nightdress. They grab her, wrestle her to the ground, and handcuff her. And they look around the place for their son, Dominic. They don't find him. Now, the Washington Post didn't do a story, they didn't run any photos, but the Wilsons sued. They sued the U.S. Marshal who was in charge of the raid. <clears throat> the district court judge was critical of the U.S. Marshals, but he found in favor of the Marshals, saying that it wasn't clear that the presence of non-law enforcement people would constitute uh, intrusion, trespass, or even an unreasonable search and seizure. But he said, in the future, uh, if the media accompanied law enforcement, law enforcement now would know that uh, they were on notice that it would be trespass and intrusion. Berger versus Hanlon puts the final nail in the coffin of reporters going along. Fish and wildlife guys are checking out the poisoning deaths of eagles. Eagles, the American symbol, it's a federal crime to kill them. Uh, CNN is uh, working with them. They put wireless mics on the fish and wildlife guys when they go to a ranch to interview the rancher who has ill will toward eagles. Uh, ranchers out west don't like eagles. They say that eagles will come down and kill lambs, ewes, and it just makes it more difficult uh, to be a rancher with sheep. Uh, CNN waited at the gate to the rancher's property, but they recorded the conversations that the fish and wildlife people had with the rancher, and they used telephoto lenses to get images of the conversation. Uh, the rancher sued under a theory of intrusion and trespass, and the Supreme Court said CNN could be considered to be the equivalent of an arm of the federal government because of its close uh, connection, close con relationship with the federal authorities. And so CNN might, under some circumstances, uh, be found to have violated the Fourth Amendment right uh, of the rancher Remember, constitutional rights generally are asserted against state entities. Uh, but here, the Supreme Court said, no, a, a news organization could be found to have violated Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, Shulman versus Group W. Uh, Group W is uh, preparing to put a realistic show on the air uh, following the exploits of paramedics in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, Ms. Shulman and her son are involved in an accident uh, in the Inland Empire. Their car leaves the roadway, turns upside down, trapping Ms. Shulman inside. A paramedic, ambulance, firefighters respond to the accident. The paramedic is mic'd. He has a wireless microphone, so whatever goes on underneath the car can be heard by the people recording for the Group W production. So they record the conversation underneath, and then when Miss Shulman is taken from the car, the cameraman goes into the Careflight helicopter, which then takes Mrs. Shulman to the hospital and an emergency room. The court finds that the medical bay of the Careflight helicopter 
is the equivalent of a hospital room. And based upon the precedent of Barber versus Time, it is an intrusion for Group W to have had a cameraman with her. So, based upon the Ayeni case and the Lane case and the Berger case, uh, pretty much everybody has stopped doing ride-alongs. They used to be a staple. I recall that when I was a student reporter um, out in West Texas, that I was allowed to do a ride-along with the Border Patrol as it checked the border to prevent uh, undocumented aliens from entering the United States. But pretty much that's the exception these days because of the liability both for the state law enforcement agencies and the media entities. Defenses to intrusion, there are two. One is the property is public, so everybody has the right to be there. And the second one is consent. You allowed us to come in, we are simply uh, making video and taking pictures of stuff that you've allowed us to look at. Uh, getting consent by trickery. In Ball versus CBS, a woman is the victim of domestic violence. She calls the domestic violence hotline up in Alameda County, up near uh, San Francisco. CBS's Street Stories is working with the domestic violence team. They want to do a story about what it's like to have to deal with someone who's been beat up by a significant other or a spouse. So the CBS crew rolls out with the domestic violence response team. They go to the Baugh household. Uh, they walk into the door with camera and sound recording equipment. Mrs. Baugh asks what's going on and a member of the domestic violence response team tells her they're making a training video. So she says, okay. And so she then tells her story to the uh, response team while CBS films her. Of course, she's been crying. She has some bruising. Uh, it's, it's a difficult time. Later, she sees a television advertisement for the CBS news program Street Stories. And it's her on the screen. Uh, she calls CBS and says, what's going on here? And they say, well, you know, we were there and we're doing a story on domestic violence. And she said, but I don't want to be on TV. Uh, don't put me on there. And a couple of days later, the CBS Street Stories program goes on. And of course, she's there. She sues. The California court says she gave consent for CBS to enter. Now, if the consent was given by mistake, or if it was obtained through trickery, consent is consent. Now keep in mind that this is for intrusion. This is not consent for false light or libel or appropriation. Uh, this is strictly confined to intrusion. And for the others, trickery can render consent null and void. Electronic intrusion in Wilson versus Lewis. Uh, if you're using telephoto lenses and directional microphones that give you powers of perception beyond those of mortal men, that can constitute intrusion, even if uh, the person doing the intruding is in a public place. In the Wilson case, uh, a team of investigative reporters is, uh, is uh, looking at the Wolfson family. They own an HMO. They're being paid tremendous salaries. At the same time, they're denying treatments for members of the HMO. And so the investigative reporting crew wants to show that they're living high on the hog and people are dying. The Wolfsons refused to cooperate and they fled to Florida uh, to a mansion on the intercoastal waterway. And uh, the investigative team got a boat, went out onto the waterway, which is a public thoroughfare in the water, and used the telephoto lenses and directional microphones to observe the Wolfsons. Even though they were in a place where the public had the right to be, uh, the use of those devices constituted intrusion.
stalking the same thing. If you stalk people, do ambush interviews, that can constitute intrusion. Hidden cameras and microphones, well, it's based upon a reasonable expectation of privacy. The Dedaressa versus ABC, um, an interview that took place following the, the uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, Ron Goldman killings, um, in which a reporter for ABC interviews a flight attendant who was on the flight that O.J. Simpson took from the West Coast to the East Coast. She says she doesn't want to be interviewed. Uh, she's standing at her back door with the screen door open talking to the reporter. The reporter has a wireless mic and the cameraman back at the news van is using a long lens to take images of her. Uh, she sues for intrusion. The court responds by saying, you were out in the public place, you knew you were talking to a reporter, you knew it was television, you did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Cassidy versus ABC. This is an older case. Uh, this happens in Chicago. Uh, some store owners of, uh, of shops that offered lingerie modeling uh, came to the local TV station complaining that they were being rousted by the police. Now, lingerie modeling uh, is a business enterprise in which a fellow will come in, <coughs> usually someone who's not socially successful. Um, women will come out dressed in lingerie. Uh, the customer then picks a model. They go back into a room inside the business uh, the customer also picks out lingerie that he wants the model to model for him. Uh, they go into the private room, he pays the fee, the model models the lingerie, changing in front of the customer so that he gets a thrill. The police in Chicago say, well, it's a front for prostitution. Uh, so that's why they're cracking down. The local station goes to one of these lingerie modeling places they set up a uh, one-way mirror uh, between two rooms and they put their cameras on the other side. They put lights in the modeling room. And of course, uh, they have microphones. Officer Arlen Cassidy goes in undercover uh, to the lingerie modeling place. He picks out a model, picks out lingerie. They go back to the modeling room he notices the lights and he asks the model what's going on and she says well we're making a movie he also hears the sounds of the camera now this is back in the old days before everything was digital so cameras had film and you had to have a motor to move the film and you had to have a shutter to expose the frames properly and in the old days you could hear these cameras grinding along and so he commented on the sounds uh, he also noticed the large one-way mirror. The model puts on one set of lingerie. She then changes into a second set. At that point, Officer Cassidy pulls out his badge and announces that she's under arrest. Shortly thereafter, a door to the modeling room opens up and a reporter for the local TV station comes in and asks Officer Cassidy why he's arresting the young woman. Uh, Officer Cassidy was not amused. He sued the television station. The court there said he had no reasonable expectation of privacy uh, because it was an unusual condition. He asked the model what was going on. He noticed the lights. He heard the sound of the camera. She said that they were making a movie. Under those circumstances, his expectation of privacy was not reasonable. Then we have Desnick versus ABC. You'll notice that these are all ABC cases. ABC was really uh, the network and the news department that was most strongly involved in using hidden cameras and microphones. In Desnick versus ABC, uh, Sam Donaldson, uh, who was a reporter correspondent for ABC who did Primetime Live, was investigating um, cataract surgeons. Uh, what happens is that when you get to be a certain age, you're covered by Medicare, and one of the operations that old people have is cataract operations where the lens within your eye becomes clouded 
uh, an eye doctor will go in, cut a hole, carve out the natural lens, and then slip a plastic lens into the eye. And in a lot of cases, Medicare was paying for operations that didn't need to be done. So Mr. Desdek is in California. He is an ophthalmologist. He has a couple of clinics. One day, Sam Donaldson walks in and says, Hi, I'm Sam Donaldson. The guy says, Yes, I know who you are. He says, We're doing a story on Medicare fraud involving uh, cataract operations that don't need to be done. And we'd like to get your expertise. And they talk for a while about you know, when uh, indications are that cataracts need to re be replaced or when, th when not. As they finish the conversation, Mr. Desding says to Sam Donaldson, now, you aren't going to put any hidden cameras and microphones in my clinics, are you? And Donaldson says, well, of course not. And shortly thereafter, ABC Primetime is sending volunteers into Mr. Desnick's clinics, uh, and they have hidden cameras and microphones. These volunteers have been checked out by other ophthalmologists who say they don't need cataract operations. But they go into Desnick's clinic, and his guys say, oh, you have terrible cataracts. We need to get you signed up and have your cataracts re replaced. Uh, Primetime does the story. Desnick sues, claiming intrusion, and the court there says there was no reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and they explain it kind of like this. Sam Donaldson, who works for ABC, which is the leading user of hidden cameras and microphones, comes to see you. You should be sophisticated enough to know that if he's there and primetime is doing a story, there are going to be hidden cameras and microphones. Your claim that you were duped by Sam Donaldson uh, is not reasonable. On the other hand, we have Sanders versus ABC, another primetime story. ABC primetime is taking a look at telepsychics. Those people who have telephone numbers, you would call them and they would tell you about your future. It's an interesting thing. We've only recently seen a resurgence of the telepsychics. Uh, they stopped advertising and most likely did other things uh, shortly after September 11, 2001. And the reason is this. The World Trade Center. If the psychics could see the future, then certainly they would have seen the attack on the World Trade Center the fact that they didn't warn anybody shows that they weren't psychic, so no one was going to be willing to spend money just to have someone talk to them on the phone. And the telepsychics made a pretty good living. They could charge between a dollar to five dollars a minute, and they had scripts that were designed to keep you on the phone for a considerable length of time. So a primetime producer uh, went and applied for a position at a telepsychic. Uh, she got the job, and then they gave her the script, and they put her into the bullpen, which is the place where all the people on the headsets talking to customers would be sitting. She, of course, had her hidden camera and microphone, so she could record what was going on and the conversations that were taking place. At one point, she's talking to two of the telepsychic employees, Mr. Sanders and another fella, and they were in the break room for the telepsychic operation. In the break room, Mr. Sanders and the other fella are talking about their dreams and aspirations, uh, and it's both touching and pathetic. Uh, they talk about uh, wanting to become rock stars, to be able to enjoy the fame, the fortune, and all the pretty groupies. Uh, the story comes out. Mr. Sanders sues ABC. Uh, there's an initial dismissal, but the circuit court says no, we will let this claim go forward because when Mr. Sanders and the other fellow are in the break room, that is not a public place. And going back to Dieterman versus Time, remember, they have a right not to have to worry about someone broadcasting in stereophonic sound or sending out images in CinemaScope. Uh, eventually, that case settled. But there are some times and places where there will be a reasonable expectation of privacy. I remember some years ago in the previous century, 
uh, our journalism department at the University of Oklahoma was asked to judge the Katy Awards, K-A-T-Y. It was the Dallas Press Club Awards. And so I did investigative reporting for television. And pretty much everybody in that category had been using hidden cameras and microphones. There were some people working as nurses' aides in nursing homes, catching all sorts of terrible video. Uh, there were some people doing stories about folks rolling back odometers. Uh, everybody loved this new technology. Uh, but, again, there may well be times when there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, so keep that in mind. Phones, don't worry too much about phones because we don't do a whole lot of taping, uh, but under state laws, you can record a phone conversation uh, if you are, number one, a party to the conversation, and then depending upon whether the state requires one party or two party consent. Uh, if it's one party consent, then if you're on the phone, you can record the phone call. It's okay. If it's two party consent, then both of you have to agree to the recording before you start recording. And if you're calling between states, you have to follow the more serious rule. In other words, if it's a one party talking to a two party, then both parties must consent. Uh, cell phones, there's a federal statute making it a crime to intercept cell phone calls. Uh, apart from that, don't worry, uh, we don't have a whole lot of cases along those lines. Uh, but the statute does forbid interception, disclosure, and use. Something to keep in mind, we have Bartnicki versus Vomper and PV versus WFAA. Uh, those two cases stand for the proposition that when a reporter is a party to wiretapping, then the media defendant has liability. So the reporter either helps someone do uh, wiretapping, or the reporter says to people, you should wiretap and then give me the recordings. If the reporter has that participation, then the reporter and his or her employer have liability. On the other hand, if a reporter merely receives uh, a tape of a phone conversation, has not participated, has not encouraged, has just been the recipient, then neither the reporter nor his or her employer have liability. That's because the First Amendment protects uh, the reporter as long as the reporter hasn't engaged in criminal activity to begin with. You remember in the Pentagon Papers case, that 47 volume history of the American involvement in Vietnam was stolen from a think tank. It was given to the New York Times because the New York Times was merely the recipient of the stolen material. It had no liability. Same thing for these recordings. Fraud and undercover reporting, Food Lion versus Capital Cities ABC. Um, Food Lion is a grocery chain based in North Carolina, and it was engaged in an expansion across the nation. It was also known as one of the most profitable grocery train chains in the country. Uh, so what is the percentage of profit for grocery stores? Say they do $100 worth of business, what percent of that is profit? Uh, if you're thinking in the double digits, you're wrong. Uh, for grocery stores, uh, on average, they're making between 2 and 3% profit. It is the volume that makes them lucrative businesses. Foodline, on the other hand, was reporting between 6 and 8%, and nobody could figure out how they were doing it. Uh, the unions said, well, they're making em union em uh, employees work off the clock. In other words, they work and they don't pay for it. And they told stories about how Foodline would take food beyond the expiration and it would repackage and sell that to customers so it didn't have to throw out as much. It sold the food itself. Uh, there were stories about uh, fish that would go bad. Uh, they would take the fish, uh, dump it into a bath of... Uh, of water and vinegar, uh, wash off the fishy smell, then repackage it with a new expiration date. Chicken that might be going bad, they would take it out of the package, uh, dump some barbecue sauce on top of it, repackage it, and then sell it as uh, chicken 
uh, that had already been uh, marinated for you and charge even more money. So ABC sent producers into Foodland. They filled out employment applications. They got jobs and they had hidden cameras and microphones. Then Primetime did its story talking about the employees having to work overtime without being paid, talking about the repackaging of expired food, Food Lion responds suing for defamation, fraud, trespass. Well, you see it right there. The trial court told Food Lion that for its defamation claim, it would have to prove that the ABC primetime story about all the bad things they said Food Lion did was false, and they would also have to prove actual malice. So Food Lion dropped the defamation claim and proceeded under the news gathering torts. Ultimately, uh, the Food Lion wins $2 on trespasses because the appeals court reverses the fraud award. Uh, initially, uh, the case was tried in North Carolina, home turf for Food Lion. It's a home state company and the jury socked it to ABC by finding in favor of Food Lion and coming up with a judgment of $5.5 million based upon fraud. The ABC producers got jobs because they defrauded the company by lying on their resumes. Well, the appellate court says people lie on their resumes and that doesn't constitute fraud, especially in a state that it has at-will employment. At-will employment is a state where they can fire you at any time for any reason. So the appellate court said there was no fraud. You guys should know better. Uh, ultimately, the appellate court re reduces the judgment until it gets down to two dollars on trespass. So be aware of that. Chiquita Brands versus Gallagher. Gallagher gets the password to the Chiquita voicemail system, listens to the voicemail, and does a series of articles on Chiquita and what it's doing with Central and South American countries where a lot of uh, fruit is grown. Uh, he reports on conversations by Chiquita executives about uh, farm workers who want safer conditions and how they're going to thwart that. Uh, conversations about the use of dangerous chemicals uh, to get rid of pests, but which all also may increase the risk of cancer. He has found out when a Chiquita uh, employee tries to phone into his voicemail and can't get it because there's a busy signal. Now, Chiquita then uh, does an investigation. They find that Gallagher, working for the Cincinnati Enquirer, has uh, been listening into these phone conversations. They find the person who provided the, the voicemail uh, code, password, and they go after the Inquirer. Now, the Inquirer fires Gallagher. They issue an apology. Now, even though the stories about Chiquita were true, uh, because Chiquita was going to sue them for trespass into the voicemail system, the newspaper felt it was better for them to settle the case. Then Value versus NBC. Uh, NBC is doing a story on tired truckers and the risks on the nation's highway. Uh, they have found that in a lot of cases, truckers who've been driving too many hours uh, won't be driving as well as they might be. And they have changed lanes, they've lost loads, and people in the little cars have died. So NBC goes to a trucker who is going to make a cross-country cross trip uh, goes to the trucker's employer and says, we'd like to put a crew in the truck. We'd like to film you as you drive across the country. And the trucker says, well, here's the thing. You can do this, but you have to promise that you're going to do a positive story on trucking. And I know that uh, this group, PATT, Parents Against Tired Truckers, has been saying bad things about uh, long-haul truck drivers you can't have them in the story that you're doing about me. And NBC agrees. Uh, of course, NBC includes PATT in its story. Value sues under a claim of violation of the contract. Uh, 
the courts rule that a promise to do positive coverage is not strong enough to support a claim of misrepresentation in entering into the agreement, but it said the promise not to include PATT was specific. Uh, and so it says that uh, the case will go back to trial only on the count that uh, NBC broke its promise not to include PATT. Making promises, you have to be careful about that. Cohen versus Cal's Media. Uh, Dan Cohen was working for the Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota. His person was losing. He called meetings with reporters and offered information about an arrest of a candidate, uh, but he wanted to promise that he wouldn't be identified. The reporters agreed to this, and then he told them about a shoplifting arrest of the Democratic candidate, the person who was opposing his guy, uh, for lieutenant governor, and the arrest took place 12 years earlier when she was 18. Uh, she shoplifted $6 worth of needle and thread. And here's the interesting thing. Um, it may have changed now. But generally speaking, uh, when you're a young person, if you're a guy, if you're in trouble, you have emotional distress, you go out and you break things or you kill yourself by driving dangerously. Young girls, on the other hand, uh, oftentimes will shoplift. That's a way to deal with uh, the emotional distress. Uh, and in fact, that was the case. She was distressed, her conviction was vacated. Two newspapers uh, reported not on the arrest, but the attempt to use the information to smear the Democratic candidate. They identified Cohen. Cohen was fired. He sued the newspapers for breach of contract, saying that you promised to keep my name out of it. He won. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that contract law could not be overcome by the First Amendment. And this may sound familiar to you. Remember laws of general applicability. The First Amendment cannot be a defense when you're dealing with laws of general applicability and the Supreme Court is saying contract law, kind of like a law of general applicability, the First Amendment cannot prevent recovery for a breach of contract. So his victory was based upon a claim of promissory estoppel. Um, promissory estoppel is like this. If you do something in reliance on a promise and the person who got you to do the thing, then breaks the promise, you can sue them for breaking their promise. Uh, and promissory estoppel is, technically speaking, stopping the promise from being broken. Tortious interference, if you try to talk to people working in a company, asking them to provide information for you for a story, uh, sometimes you'll be sued under a claim of tortious interference. Companies will have employment relationships with their employees. Sometimes they'll have them sign contracts not to speak to the media. These are non-disclosure agreements. And if you're a reporter and you're trying to get the employee to break the contract by disclosing stuff, then you may be sued for interfering with the contract. And tortiously, that is civilly, wrongfully, interfering in the relationship between the employee and the employer. And that takes care of news gathering torts. So the task will be on Monday. We will have until Wednesday to turn it back. I'm going to be posting a sample question and I'm going to be posting a video of the answer to the sample question. Try not to look at the video until you've tried to answer the question yourself. So we'll see you soon. Goodbye.